just wanted to take a second to say thank you to the church for giving us that car. We were just about transportation this one. And the church voted Wednesday night to give us that car. And I think I tired Miss Kathy out. <laughs> it's not easy to get a car title transferred from a yeah. church to an individual. We got it done. A bunch of paperwork. So we finally got it handled, and I, we thank you for the car. Because we sure need it. Before I read the poem this morning, I have a, something that I want to say. Um, John and I moved back to where we live now in, in 1998. And when we went in that door, I knew that I was where I was supposed to be on my Amen. old home place. Amen. But still, something was missing from my life. In July the 4th, 2004, I walked in that door and I knew what was missing from my life Amen. and it was God. Amen. And John and I have been, well, John's passed away now, but it's still hard for me not to include him. But uh, we've been coming to this church that long and I just want y'all to know that I love all y'all and Amen. I appreciate it and this is my home. Amen. Amen. All right, now then on to other stuff. I am America. In 1776, to be exact, on the 4th of July, I was born as American. I believe the apple of God's eye. The Declaration of Independence is the document of my birth. The bloodline of the world is in my veins. I'm the greatest nation on earth. 200 million living souls, plus those who have lived and died, Many gave their lives to protect me while widows and mothers cried. I am Nathan Hale, Paul Revere, a veteran of Lexington. I am Patrick Henry, and I'm David Crockett, Lee, Grant, and Jefferson. I am also the Brooklyn Bridge and to the wheat fields of Kansas, the Granite Hill of Vermont, and this is where I'll make my stand. I am the coal fields of Virginia and Pennsylvania too. The Monitor and the Merrimack, I am the red, white, and blue. I am the Golden Gate Bridge and the Grand Canyon, plus Independence Hall. Many stand ready to serve me just waiting for my call. I am from the Atlantic to the Pacific and through all the lands between. Live many brave and loving folks the best I've ever seen. I am the forest, the field, and the mountains. If you look closely at me, there are many things to thrill you. Just take a look and see. You can see Betsy Ross, the maker of our flag, yet there are some in our time who will call it just a rag. Ben Franklin in Philadelphia, walking down the street, the newspaper under his arm, speaking to those he had met. I am Babe Ruth, the World Series, I am your mother's apple pie. We sing God Bless America and a tear that come to my eye. I am Eli Whitney, Stephen Foster, Orville and Wilbur Wright, and God's men who preach with might. Yes, friend, I have been a nation for over 200 years and more, and with God's help, I'll always be from the east to the western shore. May I always possess courage, strength, and integrity, a citadel of freedom and hope. And Lord, let us always be one nation under God. Amen. Amen. stand, please. Pledge allegiance to the Bible first. Pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Christian flag. Pledge allegiance to the Christian flag, to the Savior whose kingdom it stands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again. 
with life and liberty for all who believe. American flag, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. You can be seated. Well, grab a song and look, note it to page 126. Go ahead and stand if you're able. Get it done right, <laughs> My country tis of thee.
sing it says a whole lot about what where our country's at right now it's not a patriotic song but uh, the state of our churches so y'all listen to the words and not necessarily the singer because he doesn't do a real good job sometimes but 
the preachers are weary, the singers are tired, the church as we know it is losing its fire. Some are discouraged from bearing the load, but we must determine to keep pressing on, cause if just one more soul were to walk down the aisle it would be worth every struggle it would be worth every mile a lifetime of labor is still worth it all if it rescues just one more soul so preachers keep preaching and singers go sing Layman keep sharing that Jesus is King. The angels have gathered, they're surrounding the throne. And they'll start rejoicing for just one more soul. Cause if just one more soul were to walk down the aisle, it would be worth every struggle. It would be worth every mile, a lifetime of labor is still worth it all if it rescues just one more soul. A lifetime of labor is still worth it all if it rescues just one more soul. So good to have the Jamesons here. Brother, I want you to come up and give a little report of your work, okay? Take about five to ten minutes, and uh, I so appreciate the Sunday school this morning. You did an excellent job. You really did. Don't worry about the slides. You did an excellent job this morning, so come on up today. Missionary to England, amen. Amen. much pastor well it's a, a great honor to be with you on the the eve of uh, your great celebration um, the last time I was in a situation like this was in Alabama and I suppose I was a bit naive they had ice watermelon and fireworks and I thought it was just to celebrate me coming but <laughs> No, just kidding, but thank you, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate, uh, it's, it's just wonderful to see people who are so patriotic uh, in this day and age. Um, I think in so many countries today you see people speaking evil of dignitaries and, um, and patriotism just seems to have gone out the window in many places. But uh, wonderful to see it, to see it here. Um, as I said, Pastor, it's a great great honor and wonderful for me to be able to be here from from England um, there's a, a county where I used to be in called Lancashire there's a city there well it's a it's a big village really it's called Parbold and on the fringes of that uh, of that uh, village which, which, which is now somewhat grown somewhat I mentioned the name Parbold, but there's a, a church there, and the crest outside that church belongs to a particular family, Standish. I don't know if that rings a bell. I'm sure it does. It was Miles Standish. Yeah. And the, the family crest is there, and uh, it's red, white, and blue. And then if I travel across Lancashire, um, and almost to the border with a place called Cumbria, there's a town called Walton. And that's where the Washington family uh, had settled and before some of them came, came, over, came over this way. And uh, so a, wonder, a wonderful heritage that you have. And I know that tomorrow is in, 
you're celebrating in independence and that great, the great unity that you, that you have and what was the colonies. And, and there was a godly man behind, behind all that. His name was, uh, there were a lot of influences, but a particular preacher came over to, came over to these shores uh, by the name of George Whitfield. And I think it was his preaching which is kind of recognized as the factor which unified the colonies at that time. Initially, you were at war. There was the Indian Wars, and I think the French had seized the Ohio Valley, uh, and then things deteriorated some more with the British getting more involved. And, uh, but you, you needed to have unity amongst the colonies, otherwise Britain would have just picked them off one by one. And the man who was behind that, George Whitfield, and he preached a sermon, and I don't want to labor that point today, but perhaps you want, you'd like to, people in America, and perhaps you would like to have a look at that sermon. I'm sure you can find it on Google. It was by George Whitfield, and it was concerning the sons of Abraham. And that, that sermon was preached and published uh, throughout the colonies, and it was a great, uh, and it was a great mover in unifying the colonies at at that time. But uh, anyway, that comes from the country where I am at, and uh, I've had the privilege of rescuing a church, which was started by a disciple of George Whitfield. Wonderful, wonderful history. But as you go across England, you see this wonderful history uh, everywhere. And I mentioned in the Sunday school this morning that just 14 miles down the road from me is a place called Lutterworth, where you find the pulpit of John, Master John Wycliffe. And, and there was a time when I, I believe the Lord used Great Britain to preserve his word Amen. And, Amen. and was perhaps the custodio- custodian or repository for the scriptures and it was in turn taken ar- around the world. I often take Bible college students visiting from the States. I take them there and I let them stand in the, in the pulpit of John Wycliffe and it's a Kodak moment. Uh, that's a great thing for them to, great thing for them to see. But just because you've got a godly heritage and a wonderful history, what's most important is where you are at the moment. Uh, the now, that's, <laughs> that's the question. Where are we now? Where is our country now? Where am I now? What is my relationship with the Lord? And so I find in, in the UK, I've got a, a lot of people come my way and they know, they know the creeds. There's so much religion there. They know the creed, but they don't know the Christ. That's right. yeah. uh, and that, that concerns me, that people know the creed, but don't know, don't know the Christ. And, and I can give a crystal clear presentation of the gospel, and yet it seems as if Hearts are so hardened to the things of the word of God. Uh, it's, it's almost as if they blinded. And we know that the God of this world blinds people. And, and yet you've got, you can proclaim this truth uh, and people are almost saved, but not quite. Uh, and they're adding, and they seem to be adding things to the gospel and perhaps it's just an excuse because I, so often I think in the more sophisticated countries, the more we get educated, uh, we start adding to the gospel and then we've got pride. And one of the biggest problems that people have today is pride. And I think that's what, uh, anyway, that's one of the obstacles that we have. But uh, I was mentioning also in Sunday school that our country is so cosmopolitan and it's good that we've got a Sunday school. Now, most of our children are not British. In fact, Cynthia, have you got any British children in your Sunday school? 
it's like the United Nations. Our church is like the United Nations. People come there. Now, <laughs> you go into the state church, the Church of England, and you know, steeples, bell smells, thermometers. That I don't know if you get that in the in, you know in the proper church. The Baptist church is not a proper church, and uh, <laughs> you've got to have a steeple and that sort of thing. And they tend to be people socialized by class. And, they, uh, and you find the classy people are in those churches, but they're not reaching uh, the broad spectrum of people. And I don't know what it is. We just seem to have the United Nations in, a, in our church. And, uh, and that's good. We're looking forward to camp, family, uh, uh, annual camp for our children. We've got quite a few of our children going to camp this year. That is good. We, we've got a good, a good proportion of our church, our children. Most important, no lambs, no sheep. So you've got to have lambs, lambs for the future. And sorry, I haven't got... My, my slides, I've already apologised for that, but just uh, just looking at some pictures which I'll have on my have on my missionary table, and you'll see some of the things that we you'll see some of the things that we are are doing. Uh, our children, uh, our children's work, um, and I'm on the streets now. In England and many of the towns, you've still got a market culture. Um, and that is you've got market stalls. You haven't got uh, big highways, five lanes going this way and five lanes the other, the other way. You've still got the quaint old English towns. And certain days are market days and they're all stalls. And people come out there with their baskets, etc. And they buy their vegetables and they buy their eggs uh, and everything else that can be made in China. All the, all the little, but man, you get all these people there. What a wonderful place to hand out tracks, and we do a lot of. I think most of my most of the work that we do in the church is not seen. It's kind of invisible, because it's one on one on the streets, encountering people, get, handing them the word of God, making friends, yeah. and building bridges and inviting people to church. And it's a slow business, making friends. But that's the way it is with Britain. That you, in Britain, you, people just don't <laughs> turn up. And of course, much prayer. You can, this, you can do a lot yourselves, and then you see what you can do, and invariably it's very, you end up with very little results. But when you keep things before the Lord in prayer, then you see not what you can do, but what God can do. Amen. So uh, just a few of those things which I perhaps want to emphasize. But come to our ch table and we'll run, run through things with you and you can see, our, you, can see the, you can see the work that we're doing. Uh, we'd certainly appreciate that. Thank you for the privilege of being with you on this, the eve of your Independence Day. And... Uh, I suppose you want to say a good Englishman is an Englishman that's disappearing. <laughs> Thank you. Bless you. There was a time that only <clears throat> the only good Englishman was a dead Englishman in America. Um, I'm still holding hard feelings that they burn our White House in 1814. Amen. But uh, I tell you what, there's been some of the finest men of God that's ever existed that came out of England. And some of the finest politicians, I don't know what English people think about William, I mean uh, Winston Churchill, but Winston Churchill is, was a great man in this country. I mean, we all think highly of Winston. I don't know what his own country thinks about him, but that's what we think about him, you know, and he was a, a tremendous man. And um, uh, England and America became great allies, and we had a kind of a rocky start to our relationship, but we became great allies, and we still are, and I don't know what they think about their current prime minister, but I like him, 
I do. I like him. I like the fact that he's really getting involved helping the Ukrainians, and I think that's a good deal. Take your Bibles, please, and look in 1 Kings chapter 11. Chapter 11. Do I have my mic on? First Kings chapter 11, verse 14. Verse 14 in First Kings chapter 11, it says, And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was of the king's seed in Edom. Now look in verse 23. Verse 23 says, And God stirred him up another adversary. Rezon, the son of Elida, which fled from his lord at Arezer, king of Zobah. When God's happy with the nation, you don't see him stirring up enemies for that nation. Uh, we're seeing more enemies now than we can count, because I don't believe that God is happy with America. Amen. I wish he was, but I don't believe he is. So why would he stir up an adversary for our country? It's because he sometimes will use our adversaries to bring us back to God. Uh, he used our adversaries in World War II, World War I. Uh, you would think with all the wars we've had since Korea up until now, you would think that we would be the most holiest nation on earth, but we're not. We're not. The Lord is still stirring up adversaries for us. You know, as far as some place in the Bible where America is mentioned by name, as far as we know, there's not any place like that. We wonder why the most powerful nation on earth is not mentioned in the Bible. I'm not so sure that America is going to last long enough in this country as far as our way of life is concerned. I'm not so sure we're going to last long enough um, to have any further significant impact upon the world. Our enemies now are tremendously powerful. I think about China, of whom we've made powerful. Uh, I think about Russia, who is even now uh, winning a war over there, and then they're going to go, continue to go south until they get to Israel. Well, we were partly responsible for making them prosperous. And... Today in this country, we've got over 7 million Islamic people in this country alone. Islam is an enemy to everyone, everywhere. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, where Islam is from, there's a total blackout on anything that's Christian. But any, in America, Islamic people can advertise. They can do anything that they want. Uh, Islam does not allow a Bible study in one's own home. Uh, in, in countries where Islam comes from, they cannot carry a Bible in public. It has been said that the American embassy in Islamic countries cannot even have a Bible study in their embassy. In countries where there's Islam, you can't hold church services. In Islam, it's officially the death sentence to convert to another religion. In this country, they build their mosque and they worship, but they deny such freedoms to people in their own country, okay? Islam is more the enemy of the Christian faith than communism ever was. Muhammad made uh, converts by the edge of the sword. And in Islamic countries, women are not permitted to drive. They can only show their eyes a man can divorce any wife he wants simply by denouncing the woman as his wife. A divorced woman or a widow is not allowed to hold a job. The only way that she can survive is to beg. If she goes into prostitution, then she's killed publicly. But you never hear the women's lib country, uh, in this country complain about those countries. You never hear Hillary Clinton denouncing those people or the National Organization of Women. And the word Islam literally means to bring men under submission. 
Islam believes God is someone named Allah. Well, let me tell you something. Allah had no son. And those are just a few of the enemies that we've got outside the United States. But as we've seen in the last few days, 50% of this country or more is opposed to a ban on killing babies. They want to continue to kill babies and have that right. 63 million children since abortion was first made legal in this country, they've died. People that would come up that maybe God would use to give us the cure for cancer or many diseases, great politicians, great teachers, you know, they've all gone under the knife in their own mother's womb. What a horrible thing that we've done here. And now whenever we finally get some uh, judges that says we're going to put a stop to this, now there's so many people that uh, are in support of killing babies that it rips the country apart. My, what have we done to ourselves? Amen? I think we've got some problems in this country that no amount of flag waving is going to help. I mean, we can walk around and, and be patriotic, but it's not going to change the country as it is today. There's no amount of singing, God bless America, that's going to make our adversaries go away. God has raised up adversaries within our country and outside of our country because he's not happy with our country. The problems we have are of a life and death nature to God. But American Christians... Many of us are happy with the, with the way we're living our Christian lives. You know, he says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Turn in your Bibles there, please. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. I've heard preachers say lately, this is not for us. This verse is not for us. This verse is for us. If it worked for the Jews, it'll work for us. Amen. It says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall do what? The average Christian doesn't think that they have any need to humble themselves. But we've got problems within Christianity. Somebody said, I went to the world and I found the church. Then somebody says, I went to the church and I found the world. We've got a lot of problems as far as our Christianity is concerned. We're not as zealous as the people who used to be zealous whenever this country was formed. Our brother today talked about other preachers in, in our, our country's history. And those people like Billy Sunday and, and uh, uh, Spurgeon. Now, Spurgeon was an English preacher, but, I mean, he had a profound influence upon people here. All these people had a big influence, and they were, they were holy people, holy people. But today, holiness is out the window, so to speak. Many Christians are just trying to hang on until Jesus comes. Well, I hope he comes too. I hope he comes today. But what are we going to do if he's not going to come for another hundred years? How is this nation going to survive? How are we going to survive? There's actually over 50% of the people that support abortion in this country. And it is going to have a profound impact upon the elections coming up in the next four or five months. And it may be that we do not have such a tremendous turnover in the House and Representatives as, as the Senate as what we thought. Friends, I think we need to pray for our country every day. If my people which are called by my name shall do what? Humble themselves. Humble themselves. How many Christian churches in this country don't give an opportunity for anybody to be saved? How many Christian churches in this country have turned their, their sanctuaries in the cafeterias and people can come and eat and socialize and things like that while the sermon is going on? How many, how many churches in this country have gotten away from the King James Bible? Oh, man, there's a lot of them. It's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. I fear Christianity has lost its testimony in this country. We don't see a lot of people getting saved anymore. But we see a lot of people converting to Islam. We see a lot of people that are converting to other religions. It seems like they've got more power 
than what we do as Christians. There is something wrong with Christianity as we practice it. And whatever it is, whether it's TV or whether it's things or alcohol or drugs or whatever it is, the kind of Christianity that we see today is not going to lead this country to repentance. You understand what, we, what I'm trying to say today? There was a time whenever Christianity was a lot more sound. There was a time that Christianity was, was a lot more fundamental. There was a time that Christianity was a lot more powerful. There was a time that, 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 that Christian people were more separated. There was a time that you would never catch one missing a Wednesday night prayer meeting. There was a time that they would, they would literally drop everything to be in the house of God somewhere. But we don't see that happening any longer. I'm afraid Christians have lost their testimony. We have failed, I think, largely at being Christians because our Christianity is not seeing, seeing a lot of converts. Our Christianity is not seeing a lot of movement. We see churches that are closing their doors all the time, all the time. Look in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I know many people think, well, if this is going on in Christianity, what can I do about it? Well, you're responsible for your area of Christianity. Whoever you can influence, you're responsible for holding a testimony that will bring them to Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 12, it says that we would walk what? Worthy, worthy of who? That we would walk worthy of God. Who hath caught, who hath called us unto his kingdom and his what? Lord. Why is it that people no longer respect the name of our Lord? Why is it that people disrespect the church? Why is it that people aren't crowding in? There was a time that Christianity was sweeping across this nation, and people were getting saved by the thousands. It's not happening now, is it? Is it possible? I think if it's possible, it's got to be with us coming back to God Amen. and practicing old-time Christianity because we don't have that kind of Christianity anymore. Today, people, it doesn't make any difference where they are. They long, no longer respect the name of our Lord. Jesus becomes a curse word. People today blaspheme his name. In order to get shock value in the movies, they blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ all the time. My, and we watch that kind of stuff. They take God's name in vain. Today, there's more alcohol abounding. You know, I, uh, I bought a, uh, a CD one time of a, of, a, of a country western singer. I thought he was a pretty solid man. I heard his testimony and, and, and about his Christianity. And he was uh, singing a bunch of gospel song, old-time favorite gospel song. And I thought that was a good thing, you know. And then I heard just the other day that he owns half in his interest in a company that produces and sells whiskey. What's wrong with our Christianity? Is there anything wrong with this thing that you see? I mean, aren't we supposed to be separated as Christians? Amen. Today, people dress like the world. It's, it's terrible. Television has given us a vision. Television has, has told us a vision about things in this world uh, and, and they distorted life as it is and they've made things legitimate that are illegitimate such as homosexuality Amen. they've made it legitimate that it's right and good to be a homosexual it's not it's not it never has been never will be Amen. today we see that fathers are supposed to be the spiritual head of the home but they rarely lead their family in prayer mothers don't rock the cradle anymore the daycare does the daycare raises children now that are violent, prone children. Material things are the call of the day. Today, 35% of all Americans are hooked on pornography. What's going on, folks? What's going on? Today, dishonesty is rampant. Today, people that claim to be Christians, they rarely support their church. People give up their church for whatever is exciting. You see, this is, this is the will of God is predetermined by what they think they ought to be doing for God. Not what the Bible says, but what they think. 
Today there's a lack of love. I'm grateful for the love in this church. I am. I mean, the love that we have for each other and the love that we have for our God in this church has got us through some tough times. Amen. Amen. But today, there should be a difference between Christianity and the lost. And it seems like Christianity, Christians and the lost, are doing the same things now. You know? Where Seth and, 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 and Abel, they were, they were different from the world. Eventually, Seth became just like the world. There's no difference today, it seems like. Somebody says, I went to the world, I quoted this while ago, and to find God, and I found the church. I went to the church to find God, and I found the world. We talk the talk today, but we don't always walk the walk today. How many people have you and I witnessed to this week? And talked to them about Jesus Christ. Have we even mentioned the name of Jesus Christ to anybody this week? Today, if we've got a problem in Christianity, we've all become part of the problem and not the solution. The only thing that stood between, between Sodom and, and destruction was a man named Lot. And because he had lost his testimony, nobody would listen to him when he finally decided that he was going to witness. Not even his own children would listen to him. We're supposed to be the light of the world, but we're not telling the world about Jesus Christ. We walk around with tracks that are crumbled up and dirty. We have Bibles in our cars and trucks that are that, that are, are showpieces because we don't use them for anything. The only thing that stood between the world and destruction was Noah. And how many people were standing in that day? Eight. Eight people were taking their stand. Today, Christians are shrinking violets. violets. We have become cowards. We're afraid to let the world know that we're Christians. God help us. What are we going to do as this world deteriorates? They're eventually going to come for you. Amen? They're going, to, they're going to know already that you've got a Bible. They're going to know already about your testimony. They're going to know already, your government's going to know, if you take a tax deduction on your tithes. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but I'm trying to say to you, this world knows you, and this world knows me. Okay? Today, I'm afraid we are people with no burden for the lost. We don't see many people getting saved today, and it's still possible for that to happen. And so, get back with me to Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14. Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14. Second Chronicles 7, 14, it says this. If my people which are called by my name shall do what? Look, if we're going to change... America, or if we're going to have any influence over it at all, we have to humble ourselves. How many people come in a, in a church anymore, make their way down to an old-fashioned altar? Or they said, well, I'll pray right here. Is that kneeling before God? God says he wants us to humble ourselves. Amen? That's what it says, doesn't it? If my people, who is my people? Is he talking about the Jews? Spiritually speaking, who is he talking about? The people whose names are written in the book. The people whose names are covered by the blood. The people who, who have come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. If my people, which are called by my name, if they'll humble themselves and do what? Pray. Pray. Prayer still works. We can't quit on it. How many of you have somebody in your family that's not saved? Amen? How about neighbors? How about people that you know? Are they on your prayer list? Do you pray for them all the time? Do you? He said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and then do what? You know God's got a divine will for everybody in this church? What does that mean? Lord, what do you want me to do? Seek my face. What do you want me to do? Seek my face. Have fellowship with God every day. Seek my face, he says. And then do what? If you do the first three or four things here, we begin to see how wicked we are. We do. If we don't, all of a sudden we humble ourselves and we pray and we seek God's face, we see what God is thinking about us. And I wouldn't want you to know, to tell you the truth, what God's thinking about me. 
If you want to know what's wrong with America, it's us. I'm not talking, you know, we can go blame the pornographers. We can go blame uh, the Hollywood. We can go, go blame everything. But the, the, the end result is we've got to come back to us and say America's in the shape that we, it is today because of the way we have turned. And we have not turned to God. We have, we've lost our fervency. We've lost our fire. We've lost our zeal for souls. We've lost our zeals for the, zeal for the Bible. And now it's showing up here. And what are we going to do now? How can we turn it around? We've got a divided nation. From the southern border of Texas all the way up in the states on each side, we've got people that have rejected abortion. And I thank God for that. Woo! I thank God. Abortion was an idea hatched in hell. And I, and, and I thank God that these states... But on, on the other side, we got California. On the other side, we got Massachusetts and New York, and we've got Connecticut, and we've got all these other places. And coming down a little bit down the East Coast, we've got all these places, these, these, these uh, metropolitan areas, that are, are thinking that, you know, we're the problem because we don't believe that a woman should be allowed to abort her baby. Can you believe that 50% of America, over 50%, I think it's 52% of America, believes it's okay to get an abortion? Well, what should we expect after 63 million abortions? That it's just four or five people out there? No, now it's over half the nation. Wow. Where were we whenever the Supreme Court said it was all right to abort babies? Where were we, and, and what did we do afterwards? We, we just said, well, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. Has there been a lot of combined effort through Christians everywhere? No, not really. And it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. Out there somewhere, there's an aborted baby that was going to discover the cure for cancer. Out there somewhere, there's an aborted baby that was going to be one of the greatest preachers that ever lived. Out there somewhere, there's an aborted baby that was going to be the greatest politician that ever lived and would have led our nation back to righteousness. Out there somewhere, there's, there's somebody that could have made a huge impact upon this entire world, and we allowed somebody to kill him. Isn't it a shame that today in, in churches just like this all across America that we have to wear guns? There's a lot of guns in this auditorium today, and I'm glad there are. We've got to take security measures. Somebody goes back there, and Bubba goes back there and locks all the doors, or Lynn does, and, and we have to do that to protect ourselves. In this country, while we're going to church, we have to protect ourselves. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? We haven't humbled ourselves. We haven't been prayer warriors like we should. We haven't sought the face of God. And people, as a result, are not turning from their wickedness because we're not turning from ours. If we do these things, God says, I'll hear from heaven. Notice the promise. I'll forgive their sin, and I'll do what? I will heal their land. Oh, I wish America was healed. But we can't blame the lost for it our problems. It's my people who are called by my name. How many of you here today call yourself Christian? Christian. Christian. We sneak around, we drink our alcohol, we do our drugs and come to church and everything's okay. We look at pornography, we curse, we run with the wrong crowd and we come to church and everything's okay. Is it really? Is it really? He said, if my people which are called by my name, if the Christians will get right with God, I'll heal their land. What a deal. Amen. What a deal that is. That's good. Amen. Amen. Sometimes I think of the enormity of 90, uh, 63 million babies, dead babies. I think of the enormity of it. Many of them are today are buried in garbage dumps. Hacked up in little bitty pieces. Scalded with acid. Some of them full, uh, full term abort uh, abortions, nine months old in the womb, and then they're killed. Okay? And that's not all God sees. Is it any wonder 
that the nation appears to be falling apart. Is it any wonder? Is it any wonder? We're supposed to be the leader in this Christianity business in the world. We're supposed to be a Christian nation. Brother and sister, let me tell you something. There may have been a time years and years ago that we were a Christian nation, but we haven't been a Christian nation in a long time. Our jails and our prisons are full. And there needs to be more of them. Just to protect us who are not trying to do those things that they're doing. There needs to be more and more prisons than what we have now. I mean, we have a huge population in America. Something like 10% of everybody in the country is, that's a citizen here is in prison. And I may be wrong about those figures, but I don't think that I am. And it's getting worse by the day. We've seen what the liberal laws are doing. It's not safe to go out anymore, amen? Not in some areas. God says, look, I'll forgive you, and I'll heal your land. Wow, what a promise. Well, those people over there in Alabama, if they get right with God, no, it's not Alabama, it's not Georgia, it's not New York. We can't be pointing the finger at other people. We've got to be coming to the altars ourselves. We're responsible here for this town. We're responsible for this county. That's what we're responsible for. And we need to get back to praying, praying, praying. Pray. And I hope and pray today that everybody here is saved. This lesson is lost on you if you're not saved. Because the biggest problem you have if you're not saved is not the fact that our country's going to hell, it's you're going to hell. Yeah. And I'm not trying to be harsh, but Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. And in the process of doing that, he would like to save you if you're not saved. He don't want you to go to hell. He loves you. So if you, if you today, you don't know that you're going to heaven, then today you need to turn to him because he wants to save your soul. Amen? He does. He wants to save your soul. I want you to know something. We've all gone through COVID. We've seen our nation falling apart. Here we are in this little town, 3,000 people maybe, but I doubt it. Little county, eight or 9,000 people in the whole county. But we need to have a fervent Christianity, whether we live in a small area or a large area. Prayer, pray, praying people make a difference. Every day we should be praying God for, for, our, for our, not only our families, but for our country. How many of you here is happy and satisfied with our government? You know, last time I heard, the President of the United States was supposed to defend the borders of the country. Amen. People that are, and it's just not Mexicans that's coming across. It's terrorists that are coming across. People are, are, are saving up their money to get to Mexico because they know they can come to America through the southern border. And they're coming from all over the world. How safe do you think that's going to make you and I? You know why there's fentanyl coming across our borders? It's been manufactured and sold in Mexico to be brought over here by the Chinese government. They know what they can do to destroy America, and they're doing it. They're doing it. Brethren, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom. I'm just trying to tell you and I, we need to get more serious about our Christianity. People's faith will decrease right before Jesus Christ comes. Remember what he said, when I come again, shall I find faith on the earth? Christianity, in order to fulfill that statement, has to get weaker, 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 and weaker. Now, that's Christianity as a total. But you and I don't have to get weaker spiritually. We can get stronger spiritually. We can be like these missionaries that we support that are going to a foreign country, giving up their own lands and going to a foreign country in order to spread the gospel. And what do we need to do here? Seek God's face, repent of our sins, turn to him, pray for our land, and we can start today. 
we can start right now. I wish you'd make your way to the altar today. And if you're not saved today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's my hope and prayer to God today that you'll come forward and say, I'd like to be saved, preacher. As we give this first stanza of invitation, would you stand? And would you come and pray for our country? Pray for all of us also to be filled with God's Spirit. You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all Oh, God, save America. Save America, Lord. God, help me to be part of the solution, not the problem. Give us righteousness here in this place and holiness. You know, I think back about the, what I've learned about the American Revolution. Uh, today, our government wants to take our guns away from us. If our citizens back in those days had not had guns, we never would have won. Amen? We never would have won. And I'm glad today that we've got guns. I am. I wish we could get the statistics on how many crimes are prevented by a citizen that's got guns. Now, there's a lot. Somebody said, the FBI said it's over two million crimes a year. We need to pray for our country. It's on an abyss, and it's about to slide over the edge. And life as we know it is not going to be that, not that way anymore. Y'all understand that we're on the verge of a catastrophe, I think, in this world. We are. Pray for your country. Pray for your country. Amen.
Well, let's be back at 2 o'clock. Amen. Brother Mike, would you lead us in prayer?